Hey everybody, so today in our continuing series on Hinduism, we're finally getting to this question, what about the gods? Where have the gods been? So if you stop a person on the street and ask them, what do you know about Hinduism? They would probably say two things, reincarnation and lots of gods. <laughs> and they're right. And so we have been focusing in our study mostly on the Vedanta side of things. And as you learned in the last video, jhana yoga, uh, the emphasis being on Advaita Vedanta or non-duality. But we haven't given enough due to one of the most visible and obvious aspects of Hinduism, and that is this enormous pantheon of gods and goddesses, literally thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses. Well, we aren't gonna talk about them all here today, but we are gonna focus down on what's called the Trimurti, the three principal gods, and the Tridevi, the three principal goddesses that are their counterparts. And we'll probably throw in a few more along the way and, and mostly focus toward the end on what is really behind all of this and how does Hinduism um, understand its own bewildering variety of deities. So one word that comes to mind is panentheism. Remember that word from the beginning of our study? Not pantheism, although that's not really wrong either, is it? But panentheism, to add that E-N in the middle. Panentheism was the ideology or the theology that describes the cosmos this way that while there may be many gods and goddesses, they are really part or part of or emanations of a higher, more divine, more ultimately real source. And so Brahman, right? Not a God, the one of the Rig Veda. That's where it all began. And Brahman poured itself out into all of this, at, including into all of the gods and goddesses. So panentheism is this idea that all is Brahman. Yes, that's the pan part, right? Pantheism part. But panentheism suggests that there is a bit of a hierarchy in reality, that ultimate, ultimate reality is up here, formless, boundless, eternal. But that boundless, formless, eternal presence, Brahman, kind of filters down through the layers and down here it kind of splits up into temporal forms called gods and goddesses, not to mention all the material things like you and I and all this stuff. So that's the panentheistic portrait that probably best describes the Hindu worldview. And that's how we can have it both ways. We can have it all is one, all is Brahman, but there's a ton of gods and goddesses that we're gonna worship and devote and have holidays about and celebrate in song and ritual and temple and all that, yeah. So what is the Trimurti? Well, the Trimurti are collectively the three main gods of Hinduism, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And that's where we'll start. You know, there's a story in the Upanishads, the teacher asks the student, how many gods are there? And the teacher says, 330,000 gods. And the student says, wow, that's a lot, a uh, bit unmanageable. Can you help me boil it down? How many are there really? Well, really, there's 33,000. Hmm. Okay, but among those, which are the real ones? Well, really, there's, there's 3,300. Okay, but among those, which should I focus on? What are the real ones? Well, really, there's just um, 330. Okay, but among those, you know, sensing the pattern, <laughs> how many are there really? Well, really, there's just 33. Okay, but among the 33, like, you know, what, what should I focus on? Well, really, there's just the three. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, that we're about to discuss. Okay, there's three, but how many are there really? And the teacher says, well, really, there's just one. And the student says, one? Then why did you tell me there were 330,000? <laughs> and the teacher says, well, those are just the many names of the powers of the one. 
pantheism. There it is. So let's start off with our first god, Brahma. Brahma, not Brahman. I know, good luck sorting all this out. It's sort of confusing. Take the N off the end of Brahman, and you've got Brahma. That's it. So Brahma is a god and is the creator god who is thought to have built this world. Curiously, not widely worshipped in India. There is not one temple to Lord Brahma in all of India. It's a funny thing, and there's some complex reasons for that. But he's certainly important in the Trimurti, in this three-part godhead, uh, because he made the world, right? So that's a pretty big deal. But he's not in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the world. Maybe that's why nobody prays to him. He's like the construction crew that built this house. They don't have anything, you know, back in 1969 when this house was built. They don't have, the guys who built this house, they have nothing to do with this house anymore. That's kind of like Brahma. He, he makes worlds and then he's gone. But let's get to the second god, Vishnu. Ah, now we've got something important. Vishnu is the preserver god. Vishnu's dream is the universe. When you uh, Google image search Vishnu, you'll see that Vishnu is often depicted sleeping, floating on the surface of the cosmic ocean. And out of his navel grows a lotus flower. And on that lotus sits a Brahma who opens his eyes and a world comes into being, closes his eyes and a world goes out of being, opens his eyes and a world comes into being, closes his eyes and a world goes out of being. And the life of a Brahma is 432,000 years in Brahma years. And then the lotus dies and goes back into Vishnu's navel. Another lotus grows with another Brahma on it. So every, you know, galaxy has its Brahma but they all come out of the navel of Vishnu. Vishnu's dream is the universe. So what a lovely myth, isn't it? That we're all in the dream of a god. And the other thing Vishnu does, besides preserving the cosmos from moment to moment, is Vishnu sends forth avatars, incarnations of himself, to the world, whenever there is a decline in dharma, a decline in truth, whenever the world skitters towards chaos, an avatar of Vishnu arrives. Krishna is the most famous avatar of Vishnu, Vishnu Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, when you read passages from the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna identifies himself as Vishnu and says, I created Maya and all that stuff. Um, one of the other famous avatars of Vishnu is Lord Rama. And you see him back there. He's often got a bow and arrow. Uh, a prominent figure in the, in the Ramayana and other uh, great works of Hindu mythology. So maybe even Buddha is an avatar of Vishnu. Some in the Buddhist tradition make that claim. But it's a beautiful idea, and it connects to our understanding of Christianity, doesn't it? I mean, Jesus is an avatar of God the Father. And, and any Christian watching this understands this deeply because they've been raised in this tradition that the Son and the Father are really the same thing. It's not like Jesus is just a messenger boy from the real God. Jesus, too, is fully God. That's what an incarnation is. It's the formless taking form. It's the eternal entering into time. And so avatars are a powerful idea. And there's a line in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna, again, an avatar of Vishnu, Krishna says to Arjuna, his student, he says, you know, um, whenever there is a decline in Dharma, I will return. And so that's, that's a rich aspect of what Vishnu is. Now, the third god in the, in the Trinity is Shiva. And this is, this is Shiva here. I happen to have him handy. So you've often, uh, I mean, you've probably seen this. This is how he's often depicted. This is called the Nataraja Shiva. Nataraja means um, Lord of the Dance, the Dancing Shiva. 
So we'll get into the, what it all, what the sculpture means in a moment. But think about this for a second. Destruction. Isn't it curious that this religion has a God whose job it is to wreck stuff, to destroy stuff, to pull things apart, and to dissolve things back into their constituent elements? Think about that. Normally we associate destruction with, you know, death and horror and grief and sadness and, you know, it's bad. But here in this Hindu system, they deify death and destruction as one of the faces of the very act of creation itself. Think about it. Can you give me an example of how the end of something is good? When is the destruction of something a good thing? Or what good comes out of the ends of things? And immediately examples leap to mind. You know, you think of forest fires, how up in the Sierra Nevada, when forest fire burns through a sequoia grove, those sequoia cones require fire to pop open like popcorn to release their seeds. Without fire in the forest, there'd be no more sequoia trees. Think about when you got fired from a job or when your boyfriend or your girlfriend dumped you, when you got divorced. These are horribly painful, humiliating, frightening experiences. And then two years later, you're in a new relationship or you're in a new job and you're looking back and you're going, thank God that thing ended or I would not have been available for this. So Shiva is the clearing away of and the necessary clearing away of old forms so that new forms can arise. So in a way, Shiva is a creator God. And when I see things fall apart, I always think, hmm, the dance of Shiva. When things break, when they don't work, when they come to an end, when I fail at something, I think, well, this time of falling on my face is preparing me for what I can't yet see, but what is about to be born. This statue of Shiva, let's talk just for a moment about the sculpture. So he's surrounded by a ring of fire because flame is a beautiful symbol, isn't it? Of a destructive, transformational, violent activity that turns things from one thing into another. So he's surrounded by a ring of fire. And I don't know if you can see it, it's sort of a small one, but he's, he's dancing on top of a demon, a little tiny demon who represents ignorance. And ignorance does need to be destroyed. Who doesn't agree with that? And you can see that he's dancing. He's got one leg up, he's on one foot, and he's got four arms. And in one of his arms, he holds the flame that will consume all forms. And in the other upraised arm, he has a drum with which he is tapping out time, which is the milieu in which things come into being and go out of being. Time is where Shiva works and does a lot of work. There are two other arms, and with those arms, he's making a mudra, or hand signs, like ASL. And one of the, one of the hand signs means, um, don't be afraid. You know, it's something Jesus says time and time again in the Gospels, fear not. Spiritual teachers like Jesus and Krishna and Buddha, and even Lord Shiva here, are always trying to remind us to calm down that we're not in charge anyway. So stop thinking that you have to run the world. Resign from your position as world manager and just become a witness and do the work that is given to you to do and then let go and recognize that we each have our part to play, but that I don't have to go around stressed, worried and miserable all the time and afraid of the end of things. Guess what? Everything's gonna end. I'm going to die, you're going to die. Say yes to that and feel how liberating it is and how much the acknowledgement of impermanence drives us back into the immediacy of this moment and then maybe we'll start to live more intentionally, more on purpose, take better risks, love more deeply than ever before because we don't have forever. 
And the other mudra, the one was don't be afraid. The other one is an invitation to join into the dance, to join into the dance that we are destroyers too. Every day I put 2,000, usually 4,000 calories of formerly living things into this hole in the front of my face and I chew it up with my terrible teeth. Plants mostly. I rip plants out of the ground. I can't quite hear them screaming. Then I put them in here and I smash them up and I use their stored sun energy to energize my body, to keep me alive. Hey, I didn't invent this system, but I participate in it. When I apply for a job and I get that job, 200 people got rejection letters. If you're applying to San Diego State for next year or any other university, you know, San Diego State University is going to get 40, 50,000 applications. They can only take about 6,000, maybe 8,000. That's 30,000 students dead on the battlefield that you killed if you get in. So there's a bit of a battle. I'm just speaking metaphorically, of course, not literally. There's a bit of a battle going on in life all the time. We compete for marriage partners. We compete for jobs. We, we struggle. And in the act of being alive, we participate in harming others. Step into that truth consciously vow to cause as little harm as possible, but say yes to the laws of life that we are here and we participate in this. So Lord Shiva is a fascinating moment in the devotional life. Again, Brahma, n not a big figure in bhakti yoga, not a lot of worship of Brahma, but a lot of worship of both Vishnu and Shiva and all of the avatars of Vishnu. And importantly, and I haven't mentioned this yet, we've, we're calling these three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the Trimurti. What about the Tridevi? Devi means goddess, because for each one of these three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, there is a wife, there is a female counterpart. And Brahma's wife is Saraswati, Vishnu's wife is Lakshmi, and Shiva's wife is Pavarti. She also goes by Durga or Kali sometimes in her more horrific visage or more violent face. Um, make a good Halloween costume, Kali. She has blood dripping from her fangs. She has a skull of severed heads, or uh, uh, sorry, a chain, a necklace of severed heads around her neck. She's holding a severed head. She's surrounded by dismembered body parts on the battlefield. Goddess Kali is a fearsome, horrific figure of absolute mayhem and destruction. Good girlfriend for Shiva. And that's one of the versions of Parvati. Durga is another one. Look, it's all about power and energy and the acknowledgement that dissolution is one of the ways that the divine plays out here in the field of forms. You can't say birth is good and death should never be. If you want one, you get the other. Like that beautiful line from Eckhart Tolle we quoted in an earlier video. You know, life is not the opposite of death. The opposite of life, the opposite of death is birth. Let me get it right here. Life has no opposite. So the comings and goings of forms is a crucial fact that is celebrated in Hinduism and in Buddhism too. Who, Of course, Buddha famously said, all forms arise and all forms fade. So these three goddesses, Sarsvati, Lakshmi, and, Par and Pavarti, are the, the Tridevi, the, the three principal goddesses, so many other powerful, potent goddesses in Hinduism. And here's the, here's the bottom line behind all the gods and goddesses. And this gets, this gets us back to the idea of panentheism. It is understood in Hinduism that all the gods and goddesses derive their power from Mahadevi. Maha means great, Devi means goddess. Mahadevi, the great goddess, the great mother goddess, is the foundational divine energy that powers all the gods and goddesses, all the boys and all the girls. 
they get their gasoline for their god motor from the goddess, the great goddess Mahadevi. There's another layer. Mahadevi derives her power from a deeper presence still called Shakti. Om Shakti, Shakti, Shakti. Shakti is the primal feminine divine energy that animates all reality. It's what Brahman pours forth to run the cosmos. Brahman does not have a gender, right? Brahman's beyond all categories, but Brahman pours forth Brahman energy and it shows up as Shakti. So this is all the goddess. All of the energies of all these fearsome boy gods come from the goddess. They are nothing without her. All of their powers are her powers. And so Mahadevi is the face of Shakti and Mahadevi takes form as Parvati, Lakshmi and Saraswati and all the other goddesses. Yeah. So that's the way that we're trying today in this video to connect the seemingly contradictory claims of all is one, but here's 10,000 gods for you to think about. It's like, wait a minute, it has to be one or the other. No, it doesn't. And today we've discovered why it doesn't have to be one or the other. One last God, because he's sitting right here and he's being ignored and I feel bad. He's one of my favorite Hindu gods. You've seen him, right? Ganesh, elephant head, man body. He's the son of Shiva and Parvati. It's kind of a cool story. There's a couple different versions, but according to one story, Shiva and his son Ganesh were out hunting one day and Shiva swung his sword poorly. He was trying to kill something and accidentally cut his son's head off. Other stories have it that he was pissed off at his son and he just cut his head off. And then he's like, oh no, my wife is gonna kill me. I gotta fix this. So Shiva cuts the head off an elephant and rams it onto Ganesh. So that's why elephant has a elef that's why Ganesh has an elephant head and a man body. But he's I don't know what I don't, I don't know what Pavarti said about that. It's not like you can just come home from the hunting trip and your boy now has an elephant head and you're like, what? But Ganesh is an awesome god in the Hindu pantheon. He's often where rituals begin because he's the god of wisdom and he's a god, he's the god of, of good beginnings. So when you, when you have a housewarming party, you start with Ganesh. When students start a new semester, they pray to get Ganesh. When they sit down to take an exam, they pray to Ganesh. So he's the god of wisdom and order and let's get a good beginning to this thing so that our project is fortuitous, well-designed and fruitful. So we leave off with our uh, our, our, our discussion, uh, what about the gods, with a quick little look at uh, one of the many wonderful Hindu gods, Ganesh. See you on the other side.